You're watching Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Pedro. Senate Banking Committee testimony by Felicia to Janet Yellen and China bans all exchanges. All this and more on episode 242 here on Tuesday, February 8th, 2018. In the traditional markets, we have gold down to $1,319. $1,319. Silver's down to $16.38. Oil is down to $60.62. The Dow is also down to $24. 4,234 points in the U.S. 30-year U.S. Treasury yield is up to 3.128%. And in the crypto markets, we have Bitcoin Cash down to $1,312, Bitcoin Segwit down to $8,377, Ethereum is down to $818, Dash is down to $602, And Litecoin is down to $149. Thanks, Darren and Pedro. And just a reminder that you can tune into Neocash Radio every week. Don't want to miss a single mode of awesome Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, uh, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Podcast Addict, and more. And we now have video. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Like and share the videos. Neocash Media YouTube channel. So a lot to talk about, and of course, uh, we were n- we did not have our Wednesday show yesterday. I'm oh, sorry about that. We had a snowstorm here, um, but here we are. We're making it up on Thursday. That's right. That's right. So one of the big stories this week has been the, uh, the, the Senate Banking Committee heard testimony from the chairman of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, Christopher Gina Carlo, and the chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission, Jay Clayton. Overall, it actually went well, considering the tone shift that I've seen since covering crypto. Both gentlemen had good things to say about distributed ledger technology and the usefulness of the technology for mankind. Naturally, issues were brought up with respect to protecting investors and the fraudulent token sales and Ponzi schemes. In his prepared statement, Jay Clayton, chairman of the SEC, said, quote, Sim- said simply, we should embrace the pursuit of technological advancement as well as new and innovative techniques for capital raising, but not at the expense of the principles undermining our well-founding and proven approach to protecting investors and markets, unquote, which, I mean, is very reasonable. That's right. The CTFC chairman was much more optimistic about his written statement saying, quote, we are entering a new digital age era in world financial markets. As we saw with the development of the internet, we cannot put technology genie back in the box. Virtual currencies mark a paradigm shift in how we think about payments, traditional financial processes, and engaging in economic activity. Ignoring these developments will not make them go away, nor is it a responsible regulatory response. The evolution of these assets, their volatility, and the interest they attract from a rising global millennium population demand serious examination, unquote. All positive vibes aside, expect regulations concerning crypto exchanges, initial coin offerings, and token sales. Quote, these platforms that these things trade on, they are very easily manipulated, and I don't think investors understand that, unquote, SEC Chairman Clayton said in a separate media appearance, which is a very good point. These platforms and these, uh, these ICOs are very easily manipulated, and there's a lot of hype that surrounds them. Right. They don't have a lo- the, the liquidity that traditional markets do. So, And... Um, in ethnews.com, they they summarized this this whole uh, testimony into into seven points, which um, I thought was uh, really good for helping me get a grip on it. But uh, if you want, we can go through them. So sure, what, what do they think? So the SEC and the CFTC need economists and technologists that understand cryptocurrency and its the market dynamics. So there's jobs out there. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yes, they, they do. Well, I think I think everybody needs those people. But yeah. but, yes. but I'm I'm glad that they they recognize the need for uh, technical experts and instead of um, you know what sometimes government does, which is not understand things. Right. So the the second point was uh, both chairmen see promise in distributed ledger and blockchain technologies. The two encourage businesses and market participants to drive innovation and capital efficiency. Blockchain technology could even become a vital part of financial regulation. And we've talked about this in the past on, on the show where um, a view-only type account for a, um, you know, blockchains that are being run with, with under financial institutions to trade things amongst themselves will actually uh, make that more efficient. So instead of having to hire somebody to come up with these reports, you know, regulators can just take a peek. Right. Exactly. That's so, a good one. 
So moving on, uh, number three, um, ICOs are almost always securities. Quote, you can call it a coin, but if it functions as security, it's, it is a security, declared Clayton. To date, no ICOs have registered with the SEC. Well, I think this is definitely one point that will come back to haunt some of these ICOs. And in fact, you know, those that, that started here in the United States might end up, have already moved outside the United States or moving out of, outside the United States before, um, you know, before the next year. Right. But not, not registering kind of leaves U.S. investors out in limbo. That's true. Uh, number four, beware cryptocurrency financial products. Did Bitcoin futures arrive on the scene too quickly? I think so. <laughs> so CFTC chairman Gina Carlo declared his optimism that Bitcoin futures may improve price discovery. SEC chairman Clayton expressed hesitation regarding cryptocurrency exchange traded funds, ETFs. He noted that ETFs typically enable long positions, something that could theoretically lead to runaway prices on an even greater scale. Wow. Well, so yeah. I just want to, yes, when we first covered the futures and, and when they first came out, I, I remember distinctly saying myself that this sounds like a way for a lot of people to lose a lot of money. And I really hope that, I really hope that a lot of people did not lose a lot of money. That's all. Yeah. I mean, these ICOs are completely new and uh, they're really easy to start. And so people that want to throw their money at them should consider that. I have a comment about that point three about the SEC chairman. Right. He's he's a guy that, uh, you know, oversees securities. Of course, he says they're all securities. <laughs> right. right. But the SEC report that came out uh, about the Dow uh, actually seemed hopeful that not every token would be viewed as a security. Right. Right. Point number five, uh, the SEC and the CFTC have been pretty active on cranking down on uh, blatantly fraudulent or non-compliant activities. Over the past several weeks, the CFTC has brought three enforcement actions against cryptocurrency charlatans. Oh, I didn't I, know. I like that word charlatans. Charlatans. <laughs> yeah. So point six, there's a messy patchwork of regulation at the state level. A federal solution may be necessary. Neither the SEC nor the CFTC has full jurisdiction over the cryptocurrency markets. Congress may need to revisit the matter to extend the agency's authorities or even establish a new regulatory body dedicated exclusively to governing the cryptocurrency markets. Well, that's certainly one point of view. I have a different one. But uh, in general, there there does seem to be um, a, a lot of messy patchwork. Uh, luckily, we, we live here in New Hampshire where we don't have any state regulation of crypto. Not anymore. Not they anymore. did accidentally regulate it. <laughs> Silly. <laughs> And then finally, point number seven, um, there are not really any systematic systemic risks from cryptocurrency thus far. The market cap remains a tiny fraction of the global economy. This is, this is a very important point. Uh, but as that market cap grows once again to where it was, you know, two months ago, uh, maybe a month ago, you know, then once again, it's going to attract that same attention and that same scrutiny of, well, we have to do something about this. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in, in contrast right now, um, you know, we've had uh, one of the largest single point drops in the Dow Jones. Um, and Gina Carlo compared Bitcoin's market cap to that of McDonald's on a global scale. It's almost like neg negligible as far as the market cap, but certainly not negligible as part of the potential of this technology. Sure. Well, thanks for that, Pedro. Uh, next, we're talking about a well, another securities commissioner. In this case, the Texas Securities Commissioner, Travis J. Isles, entered an emergency cease and desist order against BitConnect back on January 4th, 2018. Now he's back with more. This time, on February 2nd, an emergency cease and desist order has been entered against Davor Coin, what was once, quote, the number one lending platform in the world, unquote. As of yesterday, the Davor blog posted that they are dropping the lending platform part of their protocol due to legal concerns. <laughs> A cursory look at the Davor coin <laughs> website and white paper reveals only vapors and the fact that one quarter of the total coins were pre-mined. The white paper is actually full of graphics that express the latest tech buzzwords, but don't even bother to describe any of it. The only points to be gained are that users can lend Davor coin to other users and be paid back in 199 days or less. Now, I just I do want to point out that the white paper, or at least some answer or question, frequently asked question or something sector of Davor coin's website did state that there was risk involved because of the lending, but it looks like that was the whole point of this was to do lending, and now that they've decided they can't do lending. <laughs> 
Well, this so, is so at a high level. Let me see if I understand this. We we would give Davra coin crypto, and they would then give uh, Davra coins that would then be lent among people. That's right. Yeah, it sounds a lot like BitConnect. <laughs> I just I don't know why. You know what it is? It's the huge promises of returns. Their website was, it used to be anyway, much more uh, grandiose about the claims that uh, the, the fortunes you could have if only you were so bold. And so uh, forward thinking is to be yeah, a part that, of Davra Coin. That's always a red flag when it's when you're supposed to invest in this because you'll get rich. Yeah. That's, the, that's not the way to go. This is actually the fourth emergency cease and desist order entered by the Texas Securities Commission. Davra Coin is joined by BitConnect. R to Bcoin and USI Tech. So, and, yeah, I don't know if there was a cease and desist order, but Texas is a state that prosecuted the the fellow that went by Pirate at forty. If you remember that that had a Ponzi scheme back in the early days. Texas yeah. seems like they're gonna if if they get some, some sort of scheme, they find out about, they're gonna do something <laughs> they're, about they're it. They're doing a lot more, a lot more than other regulatory bodies, and they're Texas, right? <laughs> Right and and they're they're bringing down you know global Ponzi schemes. They are. It's it's totally what's good, happening. Good for you, Texas. Yes. <laughs> so we've got a story about European banks here. Sure. Um, so European banks could soon hold Bitcoin. While delivering the opening statement and closing remarks at a European Parliament meeting this week, European Central Bank President Mario Draghi st- uh, stated. Quote, recent developments such as the listing of Bitcoin future contracts by U.S. exchanges could lead European banks to hold positions in Bitcoin, end quote. Draghi's remarks suggest a more supervisory, not regulatory approach to cryptocurrencies that are adopted or allowed among EU banks and nations. In related news, the European Central Bank Chief Supervisor Danielle Noy told CNBC on Wednesday, quote, we scrutinize the issue in a regulatory perspective we are ready to do something if it is needed, but so far it's not exactly very high on our to-do list. So from the other side of the pond, some more, um, you know, observing and not coming down hard with heavy-handed regulations, which is a good thing. Yeah, I, I think this is very smart. And honestly, given, given the, the European Union's um, certain status right now with Greece, Spain, and a couple other countries having some issues economically... I mean, crypto could help them out, I think. But then again, I, I, mean, wonder- who know, I mean, who knows what, what this could mean for the future? Because it could very well mean uh, like the European Union themselves are coming out with their own currency. So they want to, you know, they want to don't want to roadblock their own currency. Right. <laughs> right. So the, the vibe I'm getting over the past few months is that and, and again, this is just my opinion, but that countries and, and state actors are now realizing they don't want to be left out, right? If they don't embrace this new technology, their trade competition will, and it will put their economies at a a slight disadvantage. So I I think they're taking the cautionary approach of letting this tech develop, but, you know, trying to have some regulation, anti-money laundering and, and other such. Yeah, I I, th- I think that's it's it's clear, or it should be becoming much more clear that this is a, a race to the next moon. Really, this is, and, and and it's a much more friendly one. You're not building rockets that could also carry nuclear weapons, of course. It's, <laughs> you a, know? it's a different type. Of you're you're building, race. yeah, you're building, you know, things that can connect people and and make a lot more business efficient. Yeah. So a story that we can't let fall through the cracks is the changing of the guard at the Federal Reserve. Janet Yellen is being replaced by Jerome Powell in the top spot of Fed chair. Before she left, uh, Janet slapped Wells Fargo with sanctions uh, given the shady history of the megabank. In fact, the Federal Reserve has arguably arguably punished Wells Fargo far worse than the government. The unprecedented uh, unprecedented punishment will limit the bank to $2 trillion in assets and require a shakeup of the board of directors. It is unclear how many board members will be replaced, but if you listen to Sen- Senator Elizabeth Warren, the whole board needs to go. <clears throat> That's up Wells Fargo. The next board uh, came from the S&P Global Ratings with a long-term credit grade cut from A to A-. The stock, the, the stock is down. Uh, the asset cap uh, will c- cost potential profits going forward, and uh, the board will will have at least some members fired. Uh, uh, compare this with the government's response of a fine of a hundred and eighty five million peanuts. Right. 
Yeah, so that is the, that's the, that's literally the government's response to all the shenanigans of creating all 3.5 million fake accounts was a, a fine of 185 million dollars. Oh man! And here the Fed comes along and actually smacks them around. Yeah, you can hold on, only two trillion dollars. Oh, so bad. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. So we first covered this back in episode 173 in September of 2016, and I remember uh, there was a period where uh, Randy was on the air, and he w- he said that. 2018. This is the year that uh, the that basically Trump will have a say over the uh, majority of the board of the Federal Reserve. So we're, we're seeing that chair change, and we're we're reaching that goalpost right now. That's right. So uh, new government, new Governor James Powell is moving fr- up from a different position at the the Federal Reserve, one where he oversaw Wall Street regulations. Jerome is a lawyer who has worked for the U.S. Treasury Department, the Carlisle Group, the Bipartisan Policy Center, and uh, was appointed to the Federal Reserve Board by President Barack Obama. Now, it's interesting. He doesn't have any economics experience, or at least there's none uh, no. presented here. And it, it seems like that's what you would need uh, in that in that position. You would definitely need somebody that understood economics and uh, was able to... Uh, you know, come up with good ideas about how to run uh, the the number one currency in the world, per se. You know, no, no, I think likely. you don't. You need someone that's going to just do what they're told. <laughs> yeah, okay, Darren, okay. you just need you just need someone who's going to follow orders. Well, and I, this guy seems like that kind of guy. I mean, I'm not not to say Jerome Powell might. I'm not, I'm not sure how how smart he is and all that but i mean it, it almost is like idiocracy now I mean, yeah like we, we went from alan greenspan uh uh, uh economics uh smart guy to, to jerome powell with with no economics experience to speak of so no there you go thanks for that darren china is seeking to stamp out all cryptocurrency trading in this story from south china morning post yeah, two weeks ago, the People's Bank of China banned financial institutions from funding cryptocurrency-based projects and activities. Now the central bank is looking to ban all access to foreign exchanges and trading websites. China has already shut down local exchanges in September of last year and has sought to eliminate all trading of cryptocurrencies by Chinese citizens. What about exchanges? Uh, Huobi has been operating since 2013, about as long as we've been producing Neocash Radio. So Huobi has announced they will be moving operations to Japan and has worked out a deal to open two exchanges with partner SBI. OKCoin is also looking to move operations to Japan and South Korea. Binance.com and many others join the list of more than 18 companies applying for exchange licenses in Japan. The flippening is happening in a way. China was the biggest player in the crypto trading market, with Huobi having as much as 60% of the worldwide market at one point. These companies may have closed shop in China, but they are capitalized and, barring license, ready to start up. This has driven traders to using local bitcoins and other peer-to-peer platforms within China. There's no news of a clampdown on such sites, and the ban has not affected the makers of bitcoin mining hardware called ASICs, or application-specific integrated circuits. Hardware manufacturing and selling is still big business in China. Unfortunately, with the downturn in price... The effect has had a, it has an effect on the profitability of the new hardware pur- purchases. I want to share with you a quote from this other South China Morning Post article. Quote, Yi, a 23-year-old college dropout, started selling mining machines last November. She said she was unable to resist the thrill and excitement of her new trade. Quote, my boss is someone who follows the times, Yi said. He sold his clothes and snacks online uh, as online merchants in the past. Uh, he told me, if you miss Bitcoin, it's like you miss a century, unquote. I <laughs> yeah. thought that that quote right there, you miss a century, <laughs> which in, in a sense, I mean, let's, let's face it, crypto is moving faster than traditional markets. Right. It's, it's, and, and previously to that, traditional markets moved at the speed of uh, sailboats, right? I mean, you have to look at what your 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 information uh, capacity of movement is, right? Yes. So if your if the information only moves as fast as a boat, the crypto is a falcon heavy of of the financial world, right? Right. The crypto is moving at the speed of electricity. So you you have the speed of light now. <laughs> no, you, you know what I'm saying. You went from <laughs> it's still got a ways to go. You went you went from basically you know a mail sending a letter to someone 
to the speed of light. Uh, email. Email. Okay. Yeah, okay. But uh, yeah, that's a, I made a reference to Falcon Heavy. Did you guys see the the big huge SpaceX launch that happened this week? No. What happened? It was amazing. It's a huge. Uh, uh, basically, it's just a it's a rocket. That it's had, the biggest uh, heavy lift rocket right now yeah, after that flight. Yeah, it's like it's comparable to the Saturn V, which hasn't been out since uh, Apollo, and. Um, it it took off and the, and uh, three stages separated, and two stages landed and they landed almost simultaneously. It was such an amazing sight. Just I only could see it online, but it was just amazing to see these two things just land back on Earth. And then um, the third part, well, it landed. It was supposed to land on a platform in the ocean, and it landed at three hundred miles an hour in the water. But uh, <laughs> that's not landing, Terry. But but, uh, but uh, the 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 main stage, which was still out in space, it uh, it had uh, whatever uh, Elon Musk's uh, Tesla in in there, right, with a little mannequin in it and a spacesuit, and uh, they they actually put the thrusters on, and uh, now it's in an orbit that will out uh, that will go further out than Mars. Wow, there's still, so for, for, for like ever. Yeah, well, it's yeah, it just keeps going around, and around, just like all the others. But it will go out past Mars <laughs> to, <laughs> to put the this, asteroid belt. We're gonna put this car up there, and it's just gonna rotate around, and yeah, it's just gonna it's, be assigned to all y'all that look, look who did it. <laughs> so, so re- reading about these uh, maiden voyages of of new rockets, they typically use a dummy payload because you know yeah. your, your maiden voyage it might blow up. You don't want to put an expensive satellite, so they typically put like concrete. But Elon Musk is like, no, let's let's put a Tesla and concrete something. is boring. Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah, so let's. Yeah, so he just put his own personal <laughs> Tesla. Well, it's not like you can't just get another Tesla. <laughs> you just walk into the plant and be like, well, they're all mine to but, begin with. But this is a really amazing thing. He had like three tries that were failures, or, or and then the fourth one worked. And if the fourth one didn't work, that there wouldn't be no SpaceX today. And um, he he financed it all with his own money, and it's just amazing to see. And he's actually got plans to colonize Mars, which. Great. He's actually going to do Let's it. Let's see it. See, very well. He's, I'd love to cover that. Is, yeah, I mean, the the government see, keeps saying, we're going to go to Mars, not colonize it. We're going to go to Mars, and it, they keep pushing back the date for that. And Elon Musk is like, well, hopefully we can do it in two years, and it, maybe that's not a firm date, but uh, he's he's got plans. He's going to send things up first so they can g- generate fuel, and then they'll actually be able, able to make a round trip. Uh, which which I still will think take, will take a while just because the distance is involved, but... Uh, it, 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 that's a really exciting time for for mankind. I think. I mean, to be around in this crypto stuff and the space exploration, and everything else that's happening, it's, it's amazing. Right. Right. Definitely. Yeah. There you go. Okay. So, Pedro, you've got another ASIC story for us. Yeah. This is this was out of the blue, at least at least for me. So, Samsung to make yeah. its own ASIC chips. Samsung has partnered with a cryptocurrency mining hardware manufacturer in China to start manufacturing its own ASIC chips. No specific details have been provided, but a Samsung source confirmed to news agencies that Samsung will be manufacturing ASIC chips. Samsung will be competing with TSMC, a Taiwan-based semiconductor manufacturer that makes the bulk of ASIC chips now. Wow. Well, and it, to sort of uh, put China in the, uh, contrast, so to speak, Singapore is singing a different tune, if you pardon the pun. Deputy Prime Minister and head of the country's central bank, Mr. Tharman... Shen Mergertan has answered some parliamentary questions regarding crypto. Specifically, he was asked about the prospects of banning exchanges and trading in general. And uh, here's his response, quote, Cryptocurrencies are an experiment. The number in different forms of cryptocurrencies is growing internationally. It is too early to say if they will succeed. If some do succeed, their full implications will also not be known for some time. In another uh, bullet point to his response, the Monetary Authority of Singapore has been, that's their central bank, has been closely studying these developments and potential risks they pose. As of now, there is no strong case to ban cryptocurrency trading here. So he's, he's, they're going to be looking at it. Of course, they'll be watching it. They're going to be, of course, worried about traders and, and money laundering and, and all those things that people bring up when you mention cryptocurrencies and the dangers thereof. But the the the... the the, the point is this, Singapore is not going to ban crypto. I think they're going to continue their, their sort of hands-off, guided approach to um, letting crypto evolve into whatever it's going to be. And I think, you know how people were saying, oh, oh you speak Chinese, you know, learn Chinese because mm-hmm. the future, I think the future, whatever they speak in Singapore, I think you should be learning that <laughs> language. Because if they, if they really do 
allow all of this technology to incubate there, I think you're going to have a large chunk of the, the future of fintech developed in Singapore and, and at least trialed there. And there's this interesting quote here, uh, and we keep highlighting that Singapore to Singaporeans that they could lose their shirts if they invest money in crypto currencies. Well, if you don't invest your shirt, you probably won't lose it. That's right. And don't do any margin trading. Yeah. <laughs> don't so, invest shirts. So there you go. Don't invest your shirt. I mean, that, <laughs> like there, there's, a, there's a huge tagline. <laughs> right, right. Be right. smart. And our next story is on Grayscale, JJ. I don't know if you want to introduce this, but I'm going to introduce go it. Go ahead. So uh, Grayscale, I believe they're the company that are behind the GBTC, which is trading over the counter. The uh, the um, Yeah, the, that's correct. Yeah, the, the, so, so that's basically... A security that's trade over the counter. It's not on the New York Stock Exchange or anything like that. And uh, people are able to take their money that are in, is in IRAs and actually uh, have some of these pieces of paper that are trading over the OTC. And uh, the pieces of paper are supposed to be backed by one tenth of a Bitcoin. And um, well, uh, <laughs> what's happened is there's been a big price disparity between what it's trading at on the OTC exchange and what. Uh, what Bitcoin is trading at. And uh, so I, I'm not very pleased with how they're uh, I mean, what do you going. mean? So is, is it more expensive? Yeah, it's more expensive on the OTC, a lot more expensive. They don't want it. It's because they don't want it. They don't want to follow the rest of the market because they're like, no, why? Or, or maybe I'll lose so much money. Maybe yeah, there's the, not enough competition in these type of financial well, instruments mm-hmm. that they can do that. Well, maybe okay, here's not, the thing. But, oh, you just need someone. You just don't. You just need people who aren't going to sell any lower. Really, that's all you need. As long as people. <laughs> that'll fix that. I mean, really, if no one wants to sell at less than $10,000, it's not going to be less than $10,000. Well, yeah, but you see, the thing is, Grayscale could buy more Bitcoin and introduce more shares. But I, I don't know if there's a regulatory burden that, that prevents them from doing that. But, uh, yeah, they could try to, they, Grayscale could intervene and, and make it um, make it kind of uh, get this thing out there. And I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of this paper Bitcoin that's coming out. When it first came out, I thought that's amazing. The price is going to go to the moon and all that stuff. But uh, now I don't care what the price does. I don't like this paper trade. I don't want the Wall Street people coming in. I just want a nice little community where we can trade our own crypto for our goods and services. That's really all I want. Welcome to the worldwide economy. Yes. <laughs> where... Yes. Where so many different wants need to be met, and they do get met. It just you know, there's different ways of meeting those wants. So, um, so the, now what are they going to do? They're going to the the uh, Bitcoin, the grayscale is ne- they're going to uh, 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 they're going to actually introduce one for Ethereum Classic, uh, right? And Zcash is that right? No, it's uh, so it, it's called the Ethereum Classic Investment Trust. So it's a new trust, and then uh, it's also going to be... A, a, they came out with the Ethereum and Classic Investment Trust, the Bitcoin Investment Trust, uh, and now they're uh, doing the Grayscale Digital Large Cap Fund. So that fund is made up of five cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin, oh. Bitcoin Segwit, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, Ripple, and Litecoin. Wow. Yeah. Why, mm. why, uh, it's like, why would you have Ripple and Litecoin in there? Mm. And why would why would you do Ethereum Classic and not Ethereum? That doesn't make any sense to me. You no, know, I, I think that that trust is just called the Ethereum Classic Investment Trust, but I I think it does do the regular Ethereum. Oh, okay, okay, yep. whatever. You know. Okay, As well, we, said, we, like we pointed out earlier that there are more smart people needed in this space. <laughs> get get rid of the paper. That's what I say. It's, okay. it's just it's just another distortion of the market. It's it's not. I mean, people should buy cryptos to use them, and if you're not going to use them, uh, I, I, I don't. I, you're in a different class than I am. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, I, I, well, <laughs> moving on. Listen, there's so much more to talk about. More and more, I'm hearing the term "falling knife" in regards to Bitcoin trading. U.S. credit card issuers are halting purchases of Bitcoin amid the dramatic fall, having lost so much of its value since December of 2017. The price has big players spooked. J.P. Morgan Chase & Company, Citigroup, and Bank of America want to avoid the credit risk of Bitcoin Segwit purchases. The ban relates to known exchanges and only affects personal and business credit cards. Debit cards are not affected by the ban. Hmm. So I think think this is smart. I mean, especially with the price going down, you know, the chargebacks, the whole of like, oh, I bought Bitcoin like two days ago, it was $8,000, and now it's down to $6,000, I want to charge back. Yeah, that was a fraudulent thing, like... And now the credit card company is going. We can't. We, we can't do anything. We can't. We well, can't. 
you know, put yeah. your trade back. And and I I think that I've, I've heard stories that they would allow them, but it would be considered a cash advance. I think with Coinbase, you have yeah, you can so, use. So I think uh, other credit card companies are not stopping it per se, but they are doing what you're talking about, Darren. They're making it so that it's a cash advance, so there's extra fees. Yeah. And, and I think Coinbase sent out a memo notifying their customers and, of that. Yeah, and those fees can be quite substantial because you get charged interest the day that you uh, take out your cash advance. I mean, I, I had to learn that when I was in Hong Kong. I need money. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, in a recent blog post from research, a researcher from Positive.com, Arsene Rutov, took a look at the pseudo-random number generators used in Ethereum-based dApps, the decentralized applications. The article boils down the issue to a lack of resources for entropy. The blockchain has few parts available to use as a seed for the next random number, and some of those parts could compromise the randomness of the result if the incentive to do so is high enough. <clears throat> like most human actions, it really comes down to incentives. If there is a bet on the line large enough, the current breed of private uh, pseudo-random n- number generators may not be secure enough to be trusted. Yeah, I mean, this is a big deal. You need good random number generators for a lot of these cryptographic protocols to There's an exist. opportunity in the marketplace here. Yeah, I mean, but it, yeah. So. Just like you have oracles who supply the Ethereum uh, network with certain information that's important, set of d- data points that you can use in smart contracts to either trigger the next phase of the contract or whatever. Having some service out there that provides random numbers is going to be something the market needs. And and there's a there's a, this is the kind of news you want. You want a researcher saying, "Hey, you better check the security of your random number generators." There was a story uh, years ago on Android where a few people had some bitcoins basically taken because uh, of a bad number random number generator on the Android platform that's that's been fixed since but uh, yeah it's it's good to have these stories about hey it could become a problem before it actually becomes a problem right well min chan has resigned her position as the ethereum founder executive ethereum foundation executive director giving way to aya miyaguchi to take over the top spot In a pair of thoughtful blog posts, Ming and the Ethereum team describe the changeover and express appreciation for the other. Ethereum has progressed quite a bit in the last two and a half plus years, and there's still more huge pieces yet to fully come online. That it has. That it has. U.S.-based cryptocurrency exchange Bittrex is going to be adding U.S. dollar deposits to offer an alternative to their U.S. dollar tether pairings. Oh, good. This is good because, I mean, it, the only money worse than paper money is a tether. <laughs> <laughs> In regards to tether, Shinhara said, quote, tough question. We treat it as another altcoin. The market agrees tether is backed by something as long as it is, as, as it is trading as a dollar substitute. But I always tell people to do their own research and be cautious in crypto, unquote. So, yeah, be cautious and... Unfortunately, there isn't a lot of, I mean, you can find some research on Tether, but to be honest with you, it's really a few people and they're, they're told to shut up because there are some players out there making yeah. a lot of money off of Tether. Yeah. Speaking of shutting up, I mean, on our Twitter feed at neocatchradio.com, you can go there and retweet all our, all our things. Uh, we, we pointed out how um, the untethered uh, account got, or, or no, not the untethered, but the the Bitfinex account got uh, temporarily suspended because of uh, uh, incorrect uh, complaints against it. Oh, and, right. and there's one thing. Uh, to me, it's a no-brainer with Tether. You can have a Tether, which might be worth a dollar in the future, or you could have a dollar, which is worth will be worth a dollar in the future. <laughs> so so uh, you got a choice between those two things. I don't think there's much uh, much decision to be made there. Right. Well, any content on the Neocash Radio podcast and our website should not be regarded as financial or legal advice. Please be mindful of any and all regulations regarding cryptocurrency in your particular jurisdiction. Never invest a gamble more than you're willing to lose and always safeguard your digital currency by keeping it in a wallet whose private keys you control. For Neocash Radio in the studio here, this is JJ. This is Darren. And this is Pedro. Neocash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. Tune in to neocashradio.com.